So uh, we can uh, we can move on our uh, next talk. So uh, we will now uh, talk about 24/7 electricity carbon accounting. Um, Céline talk about electricity carbon mix during the keynote, and we will go deeper in detail with with Olivier Coradi, the founder and, the, and CEO of Tomorrow. So, Olivier, if you're ready, can you come? Uh, can you can you join me? Hello, Nicola. Can you hear me well and see me well? Perfect. Hello, Olivier. So I'll just jump in. Uh, I'll, should I start sharing my screen? I'll let you. Yeah. You can share your screen and uh, and do not uh, forget to hide the 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 open sidebar, and you can uh, you can start. Perfect. So thank you very much for uh, for the invitation. Um, I'm uh, as as, uh, as um, introduced just a second ago. Um, I'm Olivier Coradi. I'm the founder of uh, of Tomorrow. Um, have a background in in mathematical statistics and engineering, and have been working on Tomorrow since uh, 2016, trying to tackle uh, one of the biggest challenge of our time. Uh, you've probably been already in the previous talks um, introduced to the big challenge we have, but we have CO2 is of course the biggest uh, problem that we have. Uh, the concentration is just spiking up as you can see in, in, in this graph. And the thing that I like to say about CO2 that puts things in perspective is to realize um, that CO2 stays in the atmosphere between centuries to millennia. So this means that we should treat CO2 as depth. It's basically something that we're putting up there that will need to be taken back um, or that will need to be taken back by our children, grandchildren, and therefore uh, it's an extreme violent uh, way of polluting our atmosphere. To put things into perspective, what things would need to happen for us to be on a two degree path is to have roughly one COVID without the rebound a year. So the lockdown that we had in the in the spring roughly amounted, if smoothed over a year, to five to ten percent of reductions of greenhouse gas emissions over a year, and this is roughly the rate at which we need to degrow our global carbon emissions if we want to be on the two degree path, which you can see on the, on this uh, uh, yellow green curve on the graph. You can also see that unfortunately our current pledges to the Paris Agreement are widely insufficient to get there. Um, so in this immense challenge, we need a guide and we need to make sure that all of our efforts are spent in the best way possible, that every euro spent optimizes for the energy transition. Um, and this is really why Tomorrow was created. The way that we see the company is really to try to put together people who know about climate change, who know about data, and who know about building digital products. And a lot of these people, unfortunately, are not working on the most important issue of our time because they might be working at the big corporates um, in order to make the world click on more ads, which, of course, is extremely unfortunate. The big solution that is um, you know, portrayed in order to get rid of fossil fuels is to electrify everything. We're going to have electric planes, electric ships, electric heating, electric cars, electric everything. But we kind of have to remember, okay, this electricity, where does it actually come from? Like, is it actually something that's clean? Um, and unfortunately, in most, like most of the electricity in the world is still generated using coal. Uh, coal represents, you know, 20% roughly of global carbon emissions. Um, this is a huge excavator that is extracting uh, coal from a coal mine. And if you can see on this graph to the lower right side, you have actually a small tractor. And if you look very carefully, you can see a small car here. And again, this showcases the amount at the magnitude of the operations we daily put up in order for us to be able to have electricity in our power plug. And unfortunately, most of it um, is not as green as we'd like it to be. So we built something called the Electricity Map um, that showcases the world's electricity emissions in real time, which I'm going to quickly show a, um, a demo of. And this is Electricity Map. So it's completely free. You can just log in on electricitymap.org. Um, and you can see the various... Um, energy mixes of diverse countries. So, for example, here, if we look at, uh, let's take actually Denmark, where I'm currently located, the eastern part of Denmark, you can see here that the electricity is 70% of the electricity that comes from a power plug is low carbon, 66% of it is renewable. 
Um, and if you click on it, you can actually see that the data was updated 10 minutes ago. So it's almost, it's very close to real time. Now you might ask, why is some of it low carbon and why is some of it renewable? Um, and, the diff and why are those two numbers different? And the difference is because of nuclear, because nuclear is low carbon, but not renewable. And then you might ask, but wait, in, in Denmark, how, they don't have any nuclear. Where does the nuclear come from? And you can see here, um, actually on the map, that there's a small arrow that comes from Sweden, where you can see that here, there's almost a, a gigawatt of power that is imported from Sweden. And of course, Sweden has some nuclear power, as you can see here, in their energy mix. So electricity map maps in real time, um, the, we try to map the world's carbon emissions from electricity usage, which is the ambition here. And we're covering now large parts of the, of the world. And it's an open source project, which means that anyone can help us identify the data, uh, figure out the data sources and improve the system as we move along. And I remember very well in the first days of electricity map, we only had one or two countries. Most of the other countries were added by contributors. Um, and you might say, well, that's a cool project, but you know, so what, what do you do with this? Um, so we did this data, um, this, we did this time-lapse that showcases how the European system changes over time. Uh, so this is an acceleration. You can see the time at the top um, tick. And what is striking really here is to realize that uh, the electricity, of course, is not always as green as we'd like it to be. Uh, it's hard to be green all the time. You have countries like Germany, for example, that blink. You have also countries like Spain and Portugal. And you can see that as the strong wind patterns move over them, you see them become greener and then darker. Um, and so obviously this is where we believed that any system that uses a lot of electricity and that has some flexibility should be able to listen to a signal that would tell it, hey, it's not a good time to consume electricity right now, but in two hours, it's gonna be a much better time. And this is why we created the Electricity Map API. Um, it is a commercial API that contains historical data, a database of um, all the history that is collected through Electricity Map. It has real-time data as well, and it has forecasts for the next 24 hours that help us understand, or that helps our customers understand when is the best time to consume electricity? So some of the things we've been doing with various customers is to work from, you know, visualizations that we've done with National Grid. We have electricity retailers such as Barry that showcase in their app how green your electricity is. Um, we're working with smart heater uh, to make sure that the heating system turns off at times with electricity is not so green and turns on again when it is low carbon. Um, we're working with smart charging electric vehicles and we're also working with data centers. And there's one application of our technology which I find particularly exciting is to understand um, where should we install the next renewable um, capacities. So we built an, an AI model that looks at all of our data and does a sensitivity analysis in order to understand if I were to install some assets solar or wind somewhere, what is the electricity that I want to be producing, the marginal origin of electricity? And it also takes into account the interconnectors. What is the electricity that I'm not going to import because I'm producing something else? And you can start ranking all the countries and see and say, for example, if I were to install a wind turbine in Norway, when that wind turbine produces electricity, it's probably hydroelectricity, which will be reduced. So therefore the net uh, reduction in CO2 is actually quite low because you're reducing something that's green with something which is al already green. But if you look on the left side of the graph and you look at, for example, Poland, uh, that has a lot of coal electricity, then you're almost guaranteed that by installing a wind turbine, you will uh, remove some of the coal emissions. And therefore, sort of the, the, the ROI in terms of CO2 is quite high. Um, another case which is pretty interesting um, that I wanna highlight is what we're doing together with Google. Um, so Google did something interesting because typically companies would do carbon accounting on the whole year. And they would say, on aggregate, we are consuming that much electricity. We will cover this consumption by buying some certificates, uh, by funding installation of wind turbines across the world, for example. And that has turned out to be insufficient. And now Google is moving into the second stage, which is called 24-7 accounting, where they've said, every hour of the year, 
we want to make sure that we're powered by 100% low carbon electricity. And one of the tools they have in their tool belt is to make sure that their data centers um, exhibit the flexibility they have by consuming electricity at the times where the electricity is the lowest carbon. So for example, um, when Google trains YouTube recommendation algorithms or very, very um, energy intensive AI training systems, they care less about the specific deadlines they have, uh, and which means that those computations can be shifted around in time. Uh, they can be shifted to 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. at the times where the wind would blow the most or during the day when the sun is shining. Another particular aspect is that they can also move them around in space. They can basically pick the data center um, that right now has the cleanest electricity. And so I find that use case um, fascinating. And this is this is uh, actually taken directly from their blog post um, where they're showcasing um, how they're actually shifting around the energy consumption based on the hour of the day and the carbon intensity. So the gray area here represents that typically during the day, most emissions happen um, during noon. And the green curve here showcases that they have been able to shift around their usage away from the time where uh, the electricity typically has a high carbon intensity. And this is a partnership we announced in the beginning of the year where they're utilizing the electricity map forecasts that are coming from the API as an input to their optimization system that helps them uh, schedule all of their infrastructure. Um, and what I'm particularly excited about here is our ability to replicate these things to all the cloud providers in the world, but also to be able to push these things out to all of us cloud users that are utilizing their infrastructure. I would love if at some point, Google Cloud, Azure, AWS would be able to tell cloud users when is the best time to utilize electricity. And it's not only from an idealistic perspective or you know, a climate action perspective they wanna do this, because often when the electricity is greener, it is also cheaper. So there's a dual optimization here where um, everyone could save money if we could shift around uh, electricity to be used at the, at the optimal time. I wanna speak about, uh, and that will be my closing remarks here, um, about another project that we are working on um, that will dim where we believe that 24 seven carbon accounting and the ability to shift things around shouldn't be only accessible to the few big cloud providers. Um, and we also believe that as soon as you are um, having an office with a smart meter, you should be able to have a dashboard that showcases you, when did you consume electricity? What's your footprint? And what can you change? And this is why we're launching a tool called uh, Bloom. Um, you can check it out at bloomclimate.com and sign up for it, um, which will enable you to connect your smart meter to understand your carbon footprint, uh, but also to go beyond the carbon footprint of electricity and also look at your total carbon footprint of your whole company, again, in a very automated uh, manner. So I'm extremely excited about uh, being able to, to showcase more um, when the time comes. Um, and with that, uh, I'll, I'll open up the floor for, for any questions, um, if there are any. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Olivier. I think. Thank you, Olivier. So your, uh, your presentation was uh, very interesting. Let me just check. OK, there is some question in the chat. Um, so maybe you can answer, according to the available data or granular, you can calculate the energy mix, nationwide, region-wide, city-wide. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, so we can take the example of France. We actually did an experiment uh, where we tried to divide uh, France into regions. Um, and we discovered that in the end, the French electricity system is extremely centralized, which means that by dividing up in smaller pieces, um, you actually don't get a lot of uh, extra information. That being said, Electricity Map is a very, very flexible system. So as soon as we have data quality that is at a good enough level, we try to incorporate it into Electricity Map and to split the areas up in order to get the highest granularity, spatial granularity uh, possible. And you can see like countries like, for example, Norway, we've been able to split them up in various bidding zones. I think there's five or six of them. Um, in France, we also have uh, in our roadmap to split it up by regions. 
I think we have some issues with the data quality, but it should be doable very soon. Um, but in the end, uh, you just have to remember that most of the electricity that comes from a power plug comes from insanely big power plants that are quite centralized. Okay. okay Unless so you have, have solar panels on your rooftop, which is a different, a, a different topic, of course. <laughs> yeah. So we have, uh, we have five minutes, so we are quite in advance. So do you have, uh, can, can you explain us what will be for you the, let's say, the next step for uh, tomorrow or for Electricity Map? How do you want to, uh, to, to expand? Absolutely. So our, our mission statement is really to help the world understand and reduce um, their carbon footprints. And I think we are um, right now at a paradigm shift where the amount of digitalization that has happened inside companies, um, you could say almost the amount of APIs that are available from all the different ERPs, um, from all the accounting systems, we have open banking that is suddenly now becoming a thing. All these things create huge opportunities to mm -hmm. lower the entry barrier for every, anyone to understand their carbon footprint and to visualize it. Um, and this is what we're working towards. And so we're replicating the model of Electricity Map on this new product um, called Bloom, where a lot of it will be open sourced because we want to co-create this with a community of you know, the best scientists around the world that help us build the best carbon models. But also um, the companies will help us build all those APIs that connect to all the systems they have built themselves. And we hope that we can create very scalable solution that enables all companies to get a very visible, uh, to get all those carbon emissions visible and to start acting on it. Because this is really the first step to, you know, we're talking about energy transitions and all these things, but in the yeah. end, too few of us actually know and have an overview or have the resources to spend time and get that overview. So if we can reduce the amount of resources to get that overview, then I think we're suddenly creating a paradigm shift in the way we, we can start thinking about these things. Okay, great. You you, you talk about open source, uh, and there is a question on that on the on the chat. So, do you monetize your API, your API? Maybe. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so, um, so let me talk a little bit about open source. What is open source? What is not open sourced? Yeah. Um, so, um, on Electricity Map, what it, the the visualization itself, the code that runs the front end is open source. So anyone can you know fork it and and work on it. The other piece that's open sourced is the library of all the scripts that get, uh, fetch and gather data at RT in France, uh, in Guinea, in Denmark, and all these other countries. What is not open sourced is the infrastructure required to run all of these things because it's very customized, so it didn't make sense to open source it. And what is not open sourced as well is all the AI models that we're running on top of it. So what we are commercializing in the API is the part that's generating by the AI models. So all the predictions that, for example, Google uses, and yep. all the data that we have accumulated over and curated as well over many years, because we do a lot of data science on top of the data to make sure the quality is perfect and so on. And this is a proprietary database. But we have a we have actually a free API uh, that's called CO2 Signal. You can check it out on CO2Signal.com. Um, and that API gives you a, the real-time carbon intensity um, of anywhere in the world. And you can use that um, in case you want to hack your project or you want to build some cool. We actually have some people that have built light bulbs uh, that change color depending on how green the electricity is. And they've built this on top of CO2 signal, for example. Okay. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Um, question. Can you, can you explain us how do you calculate uh, nuclear energy emission and the uh, intensity factor related yeah. to nuclear? Yeah, so that's an interesting topic, and I think one that is very controversial as well, because there's a lot of debates around nuclear renewables, and so we, we have to make sure that those numbers are calculated very accurately. Um, so on the emission factors of all the emission factors we use come from the IPCC reports, um, the UN IPCC reports, GIEC in, in, in French, that are pretty uncontroversial in the sense that what they do is that they do a meta-analysis where they're comparing hundreds of different studies that have, are looking at the life cycle of each power plant um, and they're taking an aggregate of all of these things and we're taking the medium value from the IPCC reports um, that tell us then what's the footprint of one kilowatt hour of nuclear generated over its life cycle. So it's life cycle emissions taking into account production, um, installation, maintenance, operations, decommissioning, um, handling the waste, all these things are taken into account, but we haven't done it ourselves. 
we're trusting the UN body to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, last question, uh, are you part of Linux Foundation Energy or any other foundation? So unfortunately, uh, no, and would like to would like to give, be in touch. Uh, so if anyone, uh, I mean, the person that asked that question can can just uh, reach out to me on uh, either Twitter or on our website. Be uh, fascinating yeah. to talk more about them because we we are we want to increase our open source efforts as well. We are limited okay. resources in the team, but that's something we would love to do. Okay, so uh, maybe we'll connect uh, you with, with the Linux Foundation and and and. Are you involved in any other foundation or any open source initiative that you want to talk? Uh, so not really, actually. It's, it's quite interesting because we've had a very, um, I'd say, different open source approach to what typically open source is about. Typically, open source would be about building you know, a specific technology and everyone would help build it. And then it would the, the business model behind it would not be about the data, but we would be more around the maintenance. Whereas we've actually used open source a lot in order to build transparency in what we do. Um, so in that sense, we have a slightly atypical open source um, approach. Okay. Okay. So thanks a lot, uh, Olivier. Thanks a Thank lot you. for the uh, presentation. Uh, I think your API was, uh, let's say, perfect for the for today's presentation because we talk about sustainability and we talk about APIs. So I'm sure that uh, the audience will love your API and, and will use it. And uh, thank you, uh, Olivier. Uh, I thank will you. introduce the next, the next presentation. Thank you again.